Chapter Eight of the British Barbarians. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. The British Barbarians by Grant Allen. Chapter Eight. While the men talked thus, Bertram Ingledew's ears ought to have burned behind the bushes, but to say the truth, he cared little for their conversation. For had he not turned aside down one of the retired gravel paths in the garden alone with Frida? That's General Claviger of Herat, I suppose, he said in a low tone, as they retreated out of earshot beside the clump of syringas. What a stern old man he is, to be sure, with what a stern old face! He looks like a person capable of doing or ordering all the strange things I've read of him in the papers. Oh, yes, Frida answered, misunderstanding for the moment her companion's meaning. He's a very clever man, I believe, and a most distinguished officer. Bertram smiled in spite of himself. Oh, I didn't mean that, he cried. With the same odd gleam in his eyes Frida had so often noticed there. I meant he looked capable of doing or ordering all the horrible crimes he's credited with in history. You remember it was he who was employed in massacring the poor savage Zulus in their last stand at bay, and in driving the Afghan women and children to die of cold and starvation on the mountain tops after the taking of Kabul. A terrible fighter, indeed, a terrible history. But I believe he's a very good man in private life, Frida put in apologetically, feeling compelled to say the best she could for her husband's guest. I don't care for him much myself, to be sure, but Robert likes him, and he's awfully nice, everyone says, to his wife and stepchildren. How can he be very good? Bertram answered in his gentlest voice. If he hires himself out indiscriminately to kill or maim whoever he's told to, irrespective even of the rights and wrongs of the private or public quarrel he happens to be employed upon, it's an appalling thing to take a fellow creature's life even if you're quite, quite sure it's just and necessary. But fancy contracting to take anybody's and everybody's life you're told to, without any chance, even, of inquiring whether they may not be in the right after all, and your own particular king or people most unjust and cruel and blood-stained aggressors. Why, it's horrible to contemplate. Do you know, Mrs. Monteith, he went on with his far-away air, it's that that makes society here in England so difficult to me. It's so hard to mix on equal terms with your paid high priests and your hired slaughterers, and never display openly the feelings you entertain towards them. Fancy if you had to mix so yourself with the men who flogged women to death in Hungary, or with the governors and jailers of some Siberian prison. That's the worst of travel. When I was in Central Africa, I sometimes saw a poor black woman tortured or killed before my very eyes. And if I tried to interfere in her favour, to save or protect her, I'd only have got killed myself, and probably have made things all the worse in the end for her. And yet it's hard indeed to have to look on at or listen to such horrors as these without openly displaying one's disgust and disapprobation. Whenever I meet your famous generals, or your judges and your bishops, I burn to tell them how their acts affect me. Yet I'm obliged to refrain, because I know my words could do no good and might do harm, for they could only anger them. 
my sole hope of doing anything to mitigate the rigour of your cruel customs is to take as little notice of them as possible in any way whenever i find myself in unsympathetic society then you don't think me unsympathetic frida murmured with a glow of pleasure oh frida the young man cried bending forward and looking at her you know very well you are the only person here i care for in the least or have the slightest sympathy with frida was pleased he should say so he was so nice and gentle but she felt constrained none the less to protest for form's sake at least against his calling her once more so familiarly by her christian name not frida to you if you please mr ingledew she said as stiffly as she could manage you know it isn't right mrs monteith you must call me but she wasn't as angry somehow at the liberty he had taken as she would have been in anybody else's case he was so very peculiar bertram ingledew paused and checked himself you think i do it on purpose he said with an apologetic air i know you do of course but i assure you i don't it's all pure forgetfulness the fact is nobody can possibly call to mind all the intricacies of your english and european customs at once unless he's to the manner born and carefully brought up to them from his earliest childhood as all of you yourselves have been he may recollect them after an effort when he thinks of them seriously but he can't possibly bear them all in mind at once every hour of the day and night by a pure tour de force of mental concentration you know it's the same with your people in other barbarous countries your own travellers say it themselves about the customs of islam they can't learn them and remember them all at every moment of their lives as the mohammedans do and to make one slip there is instant death to them frida looked at him earnestly but i hope she said with an air of deprecation pulling a rose to pieces petal by petal nervously as she spoke you don't put us on quite the same level as mohammedans we are so much more civilized so much better in every way do you know mr ingledew and she hesitated for a minute i can't bear to differ from you or blame you in anything because you always appear to me so wise and good and kind-hearted and reasonable but it often surprises me and even hurts me when you seem to talk of us all as if we were just so many savages you're always speaking about taboo and castes and puja and fetishes as if we weren't civilized people at all but utter barbarians now don't you think don't you admit yourself it's a wee bit unreasonable or at any rate impolite of you bertram drew back with a really pained expression on his handsome features oh mrs monteith he cried frida i'm so sorry if i've seemed rude to you it's all the same thing pure human inadvertence inability to throw myself into so unfamiliar an attitude i forget every minute that you do not recognize the essential identity of your own taboos and pujas and fetishes with the similar and often indistinguishable taboos and pujas and fetishes of savages generally they all come from the same source and often retain to the end as in your temple superstitions and your marriage superstitions 
the original features of their savage beginnings. And as to your being comparatively civilized, I grant you that at once. Only it doesn't necessarily make you one bit more rational, certainly not one bit more humane or moral or brotherly in your actions. I don't understand you, Frida cried, astonished. But there, I often don't understand you. Only I know when you've explained things, I shall see how right you are. Bertram smiled a quiet smile. You're certainly an apt pupil, he said with brotherly gentleness, pulling a flower as he went and slipping it softly into her bosom. Why, what I mean's just this. Civilization, after all, in the stage in which you possess it, is only the ability to live together in great organized communities. It doesn't necessarily imply any higher moral status or any greater rationality than those of the savage. All it implies is greater cohesion, more unity, higher division of functions. But the functions themselves, like those of your priests and judges and soldiers, may be as barbaric and cruel, or as irrational and unintelligent as any that exist among the most primitive peoples. Advance in civilization doesn't necessarily involve either advance in real knowledge of one's relations to the universe, or advance in moral goodness and personal culture. Some highly civilized nations of historic times have been more cruel and barbarous than many quite uncultivated ones. For example, the Romans, at the height of their civilization, went mad drunk with blood at their gladiatorial shows. The Athenians of the age of Pericles and Socrates offered up human sacrifices at the Thargalia, like the veriest savages and the Phoenicians and Carthaginians, the most civilized commercial people of the world in their time, as the English are now, gave their own children to be burnt alive as victims to Baal. The Mexicans were far more civilized than the ordinary North American Indians of their own day, and even in some respects than the Spanish Christians who conquered, converted, enslaved and tortured them. But the Mexican religion was full of such horrors as I could hardly even name to you. It was based entirely on cannibalism, as yours is on mammon. Human sacrifices were common, commoner even than in modern England, I fancy. Newborn babies were killed by the priests when the corn was sown, children when it had sprouted, men when it was full grown, and very old people when it was fully ripe. How horrible! Frida exclaimed. Yes, horrible, Bertram answered, like your own worst customs. It didn't show either gentleness or rationality, you'll admit, but it showed what the one thing essential to civilization, great coherence, high organization, much division of function. Some of the rites these civilized Mexicans performed would have made the blood of kindly savages run cold with horror. They sacrificed a man at the harvest festival by crushing him like the corn between two big flat stones. Sometimes the priests skinned their victim alive and wore his raw skin as a mask or covering and danced hideous dances so disguised in honour of the hateful deities 
whom their fancies had created. Deities even more hateful and cruel, perhaps, than the worst of your own Christian Calvinistic fancies. I can't see myself that civilized people are one whit the better in all these respects than the uncivilized barbarian. They pull together better, that's all, but war, bloodshed, superstition, fetish worship, religious rites, castes, class distinctions, sex taboos, restrictions on freedom of thought, on freedom of action, on freedom of speech, on freedom of knowledge, are just as common in their midst as among the utterly uncivilized. Then what you yourself aim at, Frida said, looking hard at him, for he spoke very earnestly, what you yourself aim at is... Bertram's eyes came back to solid earth with a bound. Oh, what we at home aim at, he said, smiling that sweet, soft smile of his that so captivated Frida, is not mere civilization, though of course we value that too in its meet degree, because without civilization and cooperation, no great thing is possible. But rationality and tenderness. We think reason the first good, to recognize truly your own place in the universe, to hold your head up like a man before the face of high heaven, afraid of no ghosts or fetishes or phantoms to understand that wise and right and unselfish actions are the great requisites in life, not the service of non-existent and misshapen creatures of the human imagination. Knowledge of facts, knowledge of nature, knowledge of the true aspects of the world we live in, these seem to us of first importance. After that, we prize next reasonable and reasoning goodness, for mere rule of thumb goodness, which comes by rote and might so easily degenerate into formalism or superstition, has no honour among us, but rather the contrary. If any one were to say with us, after he had passed his first infancy, that he always did such and such a thing, because he had been told it was right by his parents or teachers, still more because priests or fetish men had commanded it, he would be regarded not as virtuous, but as feeble or wicked, a sort of moral idiot, unable to distinguish rationally for himself between good and evil. That's not the sort of conduct we consider right or befitting the dignity of a grown man or woman, an ethical unit in an enlightened community. Rather is it their prime duty to question all things, to accept no rule of conduct or morals as sure till they have thoroughly tested it. Mr. Ingledew, Frida exclaimed, do you know, when you talk like that, I always long to ask you where on earth you come from, and who are these your people you so often speak about, a blessed people? I would like to learn about them, and yet I'm afraid to. You almost seem to me like a being from another planet. The young man laughed a quiet little laugh of deprecation, and sat down on the garden bench beside the yellow rose-bush. "'Oh, dear, no, Frida,' he said, with that transparent glance of his. "'Now don't look so vexed. I shall call you Frida if I choose. It's your name, and I like you. 
why let this funny taboo of one's own real name stand in the way of reasonable friendship in many savage countries a woman's never allowed to call her husband by his name or even to know it or for the matter of that to see him in the daylight in your england the arrangement's exactly reversed no man's allowed to call a woman by her real name unless she's tabooed for life to him what you europeans call married to him but let that pass if one went on pulling oneself up short at every one of your customs one'd never get any further in any question one was discussing now don't be deceived by nonsensical talk about living beings in other planets there are no such creatures it's a pure delusion of the ordinary egotistical human pattern when people chatter about life in other worlds they don't mean life which of a sort there may be there they mean human life a very different and much less important matter well how could there possibly be human beings or anything like them in other stars or planets the conditions are too complex too peculiar too exclusively mundane we are things of this world and of this world only don't let's magnify our importance we're not the whole universe our race is essentially a development from a particular type of monkey-like animal the andropithecus of the upper uganda eocene this monkey-like animal itself again is the product of special antecedent causes filling a particular place in a particular tertiary fauna and flora and impossible even in the fauna and flora of our own earth and our own tropics before the evolution of those succulent fruits and grain-like seeds for feeding on which it was specially adapted without edible fruits in short there could be no monkey and without monkeys there could be no man but mayn't there be edible fruits in the other planets frida inquired half timidly more to bring out this novel aspect of bertram's knowledge than really to argue with him for she dearly loved to hear his views of things they were so fresh and unconventional edible fruits yes possibly and animals or something more or less like animals to feed upon them but even if there are such which planetoscopists doubt they must be very different creatures in form and function from any we know on this one small world of ours for just consider frida what we mean by life we mean a set of simultaneous and consecutive changes going on in a complex mass of organized carbon compounds when most people say life however especially here with you where education is undeveloped they aren't thinking of life in general at all which is mainly vegetable but only of animal and often indeed of human life well then consider even on this planet itself how special are the conditions that make life possible there must be water in some form for there's no life in the desert there must be heat up to a certain point and not above or below it for fire kills and there's no life at the poles as among alpine glaciers or what little there is depends upon the intervention of other life wafted from elsewhere 
from the lands or seas, in fact, where it can really originate. In order to have life at all as we know it at least, and I can't say whether anything else could be fairly called life by any true analogy until I've seen and examined it, you must have carbon and oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen and many other things under certain fixed conditions. You must have liquid water, not steam or ice. You must have a certain restricted range of temperature, neither very much higher nor very much lower than the average of the tropics. Now, look. Even with all these conditions fulfilled, how diverse is life on this earth itself, the one place we really know, varying as much as from the oak to the cuttlefish, from the palm to the tiger, from man to the fern, the seaweed, or the jelly speck. Every one of these creatures is a complex result of very complex conditions, among which you must never forget to reckon the previous existence and interaction of all the antecedent ones. Is it probable, then, even a priori, that if life or anything like it exists on any other planet, it would exist in forms at all as near our own as a buttercup is to a human being, or a sea anemone is to a cat or a pine tree. Well, it doesn't look likely, now you come to put it so, Frida answered thoughtfully, for, though English, she was not wholly impervious to logic. Likely? Of course not, Bertram went on with conviction. Planetoscopists are agreed upon it. And, above all, why should one suppose the living organisms, or their analogues, if any such there are, in the planets or fixed stars, possess any such purely human and animal faculties as thought and reason? That's just like our common human narrowness. If we were oak, I suppose, we would only interest ourselves in the question whether acorns existed in Mars and Saturn. He paused a moment, then he added, in an afterthought, No, Frida, you may be sure all human beings, you and I alike, and thousands of others a great deal more different, are essential products of this one wee planet, and of particular times and circumstances in its history. We differ only as birth and circumstances have made us differ. There is a mystery about who I am, and where I come from. I won't deny it but it isn't by any means so strange or so marvellous a mystery as you seem to imagine. One of your own old sacred books says, as I remember hearing in the Joss House I attended one day in London, God hath made of one blood all the nations of the earth. If for God in that passage we substitute common descent, it's perfectly true. We are all of one race, and, I confess, when I talk to you, every day I feel our unity more and more profoundly. He bent over on the bench and took her tremulous hand. Frida, he said, looking deep into her speaking dark eyes. Don't you yourself feel it? He was so strange, so simple-minded, so different in every way from all other men, that for a moment Frida almost half forgot to be angry with him. 
in point of fact in her heart she was not angry at all she liked to feel the soft pressure of his strong man's hand on her dainty fingers she liked to feel the gentle way he was stroking her smooth arm with that delicate white palm of his it gave her a certain immediate and unthinking pleasure to sit still by his side and know he was full of her then suddenly with a start she remembered her duty she was a married woman and she ought not to do it quickly with a startled air she withdrew her hand bertram gazed down at her for a second half taken aback by her hurried withdrawal then you don't like me he cried in a pained tone after all you don't like me one moment later a ray of recognition broke slowly over his face oh i forgot he said leaning away i didn't mean to annoy you a year or two ago of course i might have held your hand in mine as long as ever i liked you were still a free being but what was right then is wrong now according to the kaleidoscopic etiquette of your countrywomen i forgot all that in the heat of the moment i recollected only we were two human beings of the same race and blood with hearts that beat and hands that lay together i remember now you must hide and stifle your native impulses in future you're tabooed for life to robert monteith i must needs respect his seal set upon you and he drew a deep sigh of enforced resignation frida sighed in return these problems are so hard she said bertram smiled a strange smile there are no problems he answered confidently you make them yourselves you surround life with taboos and then you talk despairingly of the problems with which your own taboos alone have saddled you End of chapter 8「ブリティッシュ・バーバリアンズ」by Grant Allen Chapter 9 At half past nine one evening that week, Bertram was seated in his sitting room at Miss Blake's lodgings, making entries as usual on the subject of taboo in his big black notebook. It was a large bare room furnished with the customary round rosewood centre table and decorated by a pair of green china vases, a set of wax flowers under a big glass shade, and a picture representing two mythical beings with women's faces and birds' wings hovering over the figure of a sleeping baby. Suddenly, a hurried knock at the door attracted his attention. Come in. He said softly, in that gentle and almost deferential voice which he used alike to his equals and to the lodging house servant. The door opened at once, and Frida entered. She was pale as a ghost, and she stepped light with a terrified tread. Bertram could see at a glance she was profoundly agitated. For a moment he could hardly imagine the reason why. Then he remembered all at once the strict harem rules by which married women in England are hemmed in and circumvented. 
to visit an unmarried man alone by night is contrary to tribal usage. He rose and advanced towards his visitor with outstretched arms. Why, Frida, he cried. Mrs. Monteith, no, Frida, what's the matter? What has happened since I left? You look so pale and startled. Frida closed the door cautiously, flung herself down into a chair in a despairing attitude, and buried her face in her hands for some moments in silence. "'Oh, Mr. Ingledew!' she cried at last, looking up in an agony of shame and doubt. "'Bertram! I know it's wrong. I know it's wicked. I ought never to have come.' Robert would kill me if he found out. But it's my one last chance, and I couldn't bear not to say good-bye to you, just this once, for ever. Bertram gazed at her in astonishment. Long and intimately as he had lived among the various devotees of divine taboos the whole world over, it was with difficulty still he could recall each time each particular restriction of the various systems. Then it came home to him with a rush. He removed the poor girl's hands gently from her face, which she had buried once more in them for pure shame, and held them in his own. "'Dear Frida,' he said tenderly, stroking them as he spoke, "'why, what does all this mean?' What's this sudden thunderbolt? You've come here to-night without your husband's leave, and you are afraid he'll discover you? Frida spoke under her breath, in a voice half choked with frequent sobs. Don't talk too loud, she whispered. Miss Blake doesn't know I'm here. If she did, she'd tell on me. I slipped in quietly through the open back door, but I felt I must, I really, really must. I couldn't stop away, I couldn't help it. Bertram gazed at her, distressed. Her tone was distressing. Horror and indignation for a moment overcame him. She had had to slip in there like a fugitive or a criminal. She had had to crawl away by stealth from that man, her keeper. She, a grown woman and a moral agent, with a will of her own and a heart and a conscience, was held so absolutely in serfdom as a particular man's thrall and chattel that she could not even go out to visit a friend without these degrading subterfuges of creeping in unperceived by a back entrance, and talking low under her breath, lest a lodging-house crone should find out what she was doing. And all the world of England was so banded in league with the slave-driver against the soul he enslaved, that if Miss Blake had seen her, she could hardly have come in, while once in, she must tremble and whisper and steal about with muffled feet for fear of discovery in this innocent adventure. He held his breath with stifled wrath. It was painful and degrading. But he had no time just then to think much of all this, for there sat Frida, tremulous and shivering before his very eyes, trying hard to hide her beautiful white face in her quivering hands, and murmuring over and over again in a very low voice like an agonised creature, I couldn't bear not to be allowed to say good-bye to you for ever. Bertram smoothed her cheek gently. She tried to prevent him, but he went on in spite of her, with a man's strong persistence. Notwithstanding his gentleness, he was always virile. "'Good-bye!' he cried. "'Good-bye! Why on earth good-bye, Frida? 
When I left you before dinner, you never said one word of it to me. Oh, no, Frida cried, sobbing. It's all Robert, Robert. As soon as ever you were gone, he called me into the library, which always means he's going to talk over some dreadful business with me. And he said to me, Frida, I've just heard from Phil that this man ingled you, who's chosen to foist himself upon us, holds opinions and sentiments which entirely unfit him from being proper company for any lady. Now he's been coming here a great deal too often of late. Next time he calls, I wish you to tell Martha you're not at home to him. Bertram looked across at her with a melting look in his honest blue eyes. "'And you came round to tell me of it, you dear thing,' he cried, seizing her hand and grasping it hard. "'Oh, Frida, how kind of you!' Frida trembled from head to foot. The blood throbbed in her pulse. "'Then you're not vexed with me?' she sobbed out all tremulous with gladness. "'Vexed with you! Oh, Frida, how could I be vexed? You poor child! I'm so pleased, so glad, so grateful!' Frida let her hand rest unresisting in his. But bertram she murmured, "'I must call you Bertram. I couldn't help it, you know.' I like you so much, I couldn't let you go for ever without just saying good-bye to you. You don't like me, you love me, Bertram answered with masculine confidence. No, you needn't blush, Frida. You can't deceive me. My darling, you love me, and you know I love you. Why should we two make any secret about our hearts any longer. He laid his hand on her face again, making it tingle with joy. Frida, he said solemnly, you don't love that man you call your husband. You haven't loved him for years. You never really loved him. There was something about the mere sound of Bertram's calm voice that made Frida speak the truth more plainly and frankly than she could ever have spoken it to any ordinary Englishman. Yet she hung down her head even so, and hesitated slightly. "'Just at first, she murmured half inaudibly, "'I used to think I loved him.' At any rate, I was pleased and flattered he should marry me. Pleased and flattered, Bertram exclaimed, more to himself than to her. Great heavens, how incredible! Pleased and flattered by that man, one can hardly conceive it. But you've never loved him since, Frida. You can't look me in the face and tell me you love him. No, not since the first few months, Frida answered, still hanging her head. But, Bertram, he's my husband, and of course I must obey him. You must do nothing of the sort, Bertram cried authoritatively. You don't love him at all, and you mustn't pretend to. It's wrong. It's wicked. Sooner or later, he checked himself. Frida, he went on after a moment's pause, I won't speak to you of what I was going to say just now. I'll wait a bit till you're stronger and better able to understand it. But there must be no more silly talk of farewells between us. I won't allow it. You're mine now a thousand times more truly mine than ever you were Monteith's, and I can't do without you. You must go back to your husband for the present, I suppose. The circumstances compel it, 
though I don't approve of it. But you must see me again, and soon, and often, just the same as usual. I won't go to your house, of course. The house is Monteith's, and everywhere among civilised and rational races the sanctity of the home is rightly respected. But you yourself, he has no claim or right to taboo, and if I can help it, he shan't taboo you. You may go home now to-night, dear one, but you must meet me often. If you can't come round to my rooms for fear of Miss Blake's fetish, the respectability of her house, we must meet elsewhere till I can make fresh arrangements. Frida gazed up at him in doubt. But will it be right, Bertram? she murmured. The man looked down into her big eyes in dazed astonishment. Why, Frida! he cried, half pained at the question. Do you think if it were wrong I'd advise you to do it? I'm here to help you, to guide you, to lead you on by degrees to higher and truer life. How can you imagine I'd ask you to do anything on earth, unless I felt perfectly sure and convinced it was the very most right and proper conduct? His arm stole round her waist and drew her tenderly towards him. Frida allowed the caress passively. There was a robust frankness about his love-making that seemed to rob it of all taint or tinge of evil. Then he caught her bodily in his arms, like a man who has never associated the purest and noblest of human passions with any lower thought, any baser personality. He had not taken his first lessons in the art of love from the wearied lips of joyless courtesans, whom his own kind had debased and unsexed and degraded out of all semblance of womanhood. He bent over the woman of his choice, and kissed her chaste warmth. On the forehead first, then, after a short interval, twice on the lips. At each kiss from which she somehow did not shrink, as if recognising its purity, Frida felt a strange thrill course through and through her. She quivered from head to foot. The scales fell from her eyes. The taboos of her race grew null and void within her. She looked up at him more boldly. Oh, Bertram, she whispered, nestling close to his side, and burying her blushing face in the man's curved bosom. I don't know what you've done to me, but I feel quite different, as if I'd eaten the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I hope you have, Bertram answered in a very solemn voice. For, Frida, you will need it. He pressed her close against his breast, and Frida Monteith, a free woman at last, clung there many minutes, with no vile inherited sense of shame or wrongfulness. I can't bear to go, she cried, still clinging to him and clutching him tight. I'm so happy here, Bertram. Oh, so happy. So happy. Then why go away at all? Bertram asked quite simply. Frida drew back in horror. Oh, I must, she said, coming to herself. I must, of course, because of Robert. Bertram held her hand smoothing it all the while with his own, as he mused and hesitated. "'Well, it's clearly wrong to go back,' he said, after a moment's pause. 
you ought never, of course, to spend another night with that man you don't love and should never have lived with. But I suppose that's only a counsel of perfection, too hard a saying for you to understand or follow for the present. You'd better go back, just tonight, and as time moves on, I can arrange something else for you. But when shall I see you again? For now you belong to me. I sealed you with that kiss. When will you come and see me? I can't come here, you know, Frida whispered, half terrified. For if I did, Miss Blake would see me. Bertram smiled a bitter smile to himself. So she would, he said, musing. And though she's not the least interested in keeping up Robert Monteith's proprietary claim on your life and freedom, I'm beginning to understand now that it would be an offence against that mysterious and incomprehensible entity they call respectability if she were to allow me to receive you in her rooms. It's all very curious. But, of course, while I remain, I must be content to submit to it. By and by, perhaps, Frida, we two may manage to escape together from this iron generation. Meanwhile, I shall go up to London less often for the present, and you can come and meet me, dear, in the Middle Mill Fields at two o'clock on Monday. She gazed up at him with perfect trust in those luminous dark eyes of hers. "'I will, Bertram,' she said firmly. She knew not herself what his kiss had done for her, but one thing she knew. From the moment their lips met, she had felt and understood in a flood of vision that perfect love which casteth out fear and was no longer afraid of him. "'That's right, darling,' the man answered, stooping down and laying his cheek against her own once more. "'You are mine, and I am yours. You are not and never were Robert Monteith's, my Frida. So now, good night, till Monday at two, beside the stile in Middle Mill Meadows. She clung to him for a moment in a passionate embrace. He let her stop there while he smoothed her dark hair with one free hand. Then, suddenly, with a burst, the older feelings of her race overcame her for a minute. She broke from his grasp and hid her head all crimson in a cushion on the sofa. One second later, again, she lifted her face, unabashed. The new impulse stirred her. "'I'm proud I love you, Bertram,' she cried, with red lips and flashing eyes. "'And I'm proud you love me.' With that she slipped quietly out, and walked, erect and graceful, no longer ashamed, down the lodging-house passage. End of chapter 9of the British Barbarians. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. The British Barbarians by Grant Allen. Chapter 10. When she returned, Robert Monteith sat asleep over his paper in his easy chair. It was his wont at night when he returned from business. Frida cast one contemptuous glance as she passed at his burly, unintelligent form, and went up to her bedroom. But all that night long she never slept. Her head was too full of Bertram Ingledew. Yet, strange to say, she felt not one qualm of conscience for their stolen meeting. 
no feminine terror no fluttering fear disturbed her equanimity it almost seemed to her as if bertram's kiss had released her by magic at once and for ever from the taboos of her nation she had slipped out from home unperceived that night in fear and trembling with many sinkings of heart and dire misgivings while robert and phil were downstairs in the smoking-room she had slunk round crouching low to miss blake's lodgings and she had terrified her soul on the way with a good woman's doubts and a good woman's fears as to the wrongfulness of her attempt to say good-bye to the friend she might now no longer mix with but from the moment her lips and bertram's touched all fear and doubt seemed utterly to have vanished she lay there all night in a fierce ecstasy of love hugging herself for strange delight thinking only of bertram and wondering what manner of thing was this promised freedom whereof her lover had spoken to her so confidently she trusted him now she knew he would do right and right alone whatever he advised she would be safe in following next day robert went up to town to business as usual he was immersed in palm oil by a quarter to two frida found herself in the fields but early as she went to fulfil her tryst bertram was there before her he took her hand in his with a gentle pressure and frida felt a quick thrill she had never before experienced course suddenly through her she looked round to right and left to see if they were observed bertram noticed the instinctive movement my darling he said in a low voice this is intolerable unendurable it's an insult not to be borne that you and i can't walk together in the fields of england without being subjected thus to such a many-headed espionage i shall have to arrange something before long so as to see you at leisure i can't be so bound by all the taboos of your country she looked up at him trustfully as you will bertram she answered without a moment's hesitation i know i'm yours now let it be what it may i can do what you tell me he looked at her and smiled he saw she was pure woman he had met at last with a sister soul there was a long deep silence frida was the first to break it with words why do you always call them taboos bertram she asked at last sighing why frida don't you see he said walking on through the deep grass because they are taboos that's the only reason why not give them their true name we call them nothing else among my own people all taboos are the same in origin and spirit whether savage or civilized eastern or western you must see that now for i know you are emancipated they begin with belief in some fetish or bogey or other non-existent supernatural being and they mostly go on to regard certain absolutely harmless nay sometimes even praiseworthy or morally obligatory acts as proscribed by him and sure to be visited with his condign displeasure so south sea islanders think if they eat some particular luscious fruit tabooed for the chiefs they'll be instantly struck dead by the mere power of the taboo in it and english people think 
if they go out in the country for a picnic on a tabooed day, or use certain harmless tabooed names and words, or inquire into the historical validity of certain incredible ancient documents accounted sacred, or even dare to think certain things that no reasonable man can prevent himself from thinking, they'll be burned for ever in eternal fire for it. The common element is the dread of an unreal sanction. So in Japan and West Africa the people believe the whole existence of the world and the universe is bound up with the health of their own particular king, or the safety of their own particular royal family, and therefore they won't allow their mikado or their chief to go outside his palace, lest he should knock his royal foot against a stone, and so prevent the sun from shining and the rain from falling. In other places it's a tree or a shrub with which the stability and persistence of the world is bound up. Whenever that tree or shrub begins to droop or wither, the whole population rushes out in bodily fear and awe, bearing water to pour upon it, and crying aloud with wild cries as if their lives were in danger. If any man were to injure the tree, which of course is no more valuable than any other bush of its sort, they tear him to pieces on the spot, and kill or torture every member of his family. And so too in England most people believe, without a shadow of reason, that if men and women were allowed to manage their own personal relations, free from tribal interference, all life and order would go to rack and ruin. The world would become one vast horrible orgy, and society would dissolve in some incredible fashion. To prevent this imaginary and impossible result, they insist upon regulating one another's lives from outside with the strictest taboos, like those which hem round the West African kings, and punish with cruel and relentless heartlessness every man, and still more every woman, who dares to transgress them. I think I see what you mean, Frida answered, blushing. And I mean it in the very simplest and most literal sense, Bertram went on quite seriously. I'd been among you some time before it began to dawn on me that you English didn't regard your own taboos as essentially identical with other people's. To me, from the very first, they seemed absolutely the same as the similar taboos of Central Africans and South Sea Islanders. All of them spring alike from a common origin, the queer, savage belief that various harmless or actually beneficial things may become at times, in some mysterious way, harmful and dangerous. The essence of them all lies in the erroneous idea that if certain contingencies occur, such as breaking an image or deserting a faith, some terrible evil will follow to one man or to the world, which evil, as a matter of fact, there's no reason at all to dread in any way. Sometimes, as in ancient Rome, Egypt, Central Africa, and England, the whole of life gets enveloped at last in a perfect mist and labyrinth of taboos, a cobweb of conventions. The Flamen Dialis at Rome, you know, mightn't ride or even touch a horse. He mightn't see an army under arms, nor wear a ring that wasn't broken, nor have a knot in any part of his clothing. He mightn't eat wheaten flour or leavened bread. 
he mightn't look at or even mention by name such unlucky things as a goat, a dog, raw meat, haricot beans, or common ivy. He mightn't walk under a vine. The feet of his bed had to be daubed with mud. His hair could only be cut by a free man and with a bronze knife. He was encased and surrounded, as it were, by endless petty restrictions and regulations and taboos, just like those that now surround so many men, and especially so many young women, here in England. "'And you think they arise from the same causes?' Frida said, half hesitating, for she hardly knew whether it was not wicked to say so. "'Why, of course they do!' Bertram answered confidently. "'That's not matter of opinion now. It's matter of demonstration. The worst of them all, in their present complicated state, are the ones that concern marriage and the other hideous sex taboos. They seem to have been among the earliest human abuses, for marriage arises from the Stone Age practice of felling a woman of another tribe with a blow of one's club, and dragging her off by the hair of her head to one's own cave as a slave and drudge. And they are still the most persistent and cruel of any, so much so that your own people, as you know, taboo even the fair and free discussion of this, the most important and serious question of life and morals. They make it, as we would say at home, a refuge for enforced ignorance. For it's well known that early tribes hold the most superstitious ideas about the relation of men to women, and dread the most ridiculous and impossible evils resulting from it. And these absurd terrors of theirs seem to have been handed on intact to civilized races, so that for fear of I know not what ridiculous bogey of their own imaginations, or dread of some unnatural restraining deity, men won't even discuss a matter of so much importance to them all, but rather than let the taboo of silence be broken, will allow such horrible things to take place in their midst as I have seen with my eyes for these last six or seven weeks in your cities. Oh, Frida, you can't imagine what things, for I know they hide them from you. Cruelties of lust and neglect and shame such as you couldn't even dream of. Women dying of foul disease in want and dirt deliberately forced upon them by the will of your society. Destined beforehand for death, a hateful lingering death, a death more disgusting than aught you can conceive. In order that the rest of you may be safely tabooed, each a maid intact for the man who weds her. It's the hatefulest taboo of all the hateful taboos I've ever seen on my wanderings, the unworthiest of a pure or moral community. He shut his eyes as if to forget the horrors of which he spoke. They were fresh and real to him. Frida did not like to question him further. She knew to what he referred, and in a dim, vague way, for she was less wise than he, she knew, she thought she could imagine why he found it all so terrible. They walked on in silence a while through the deep, lush grass of the July meadow. At last Bertram spoke again. Frida, he said with a trembling quiver, I didn't sleep last night. I was thinking this thing over, 
this question of our relations. Nor did I, Frida answered, thrilling through, responsive. I was thinking the same thing, and, Bertram, "'Twas the happiest night I ever remember. "'Bertram's face flushed rosy red, "'that native colour of triumphant love, "'but he answered nothing. "'He only looked at her with a look "'more eloquent by far than a thousand speeches. "'Frida,' he went on at last, "'I've been thinking it all over, "'and I feel... If only you can come away with me for just seven days, I could arrange at the end of that time to take you home with me. Frida's face in turn waxed rosy red, but she answered only in a very low voice, Thank you, Bertram. Would you go with me? Bertram cried, his face aglow with pleasure. You know it's a very, very long way off, and I can't even tell you where it is or how you get there. But can you trust me enough to try? Are you not afraid to come with me? Frida's voice trembled slightly. I'm not afraid, if that's all, she answered in a very firm tone. I love you, and I trust you and I could follow you to the world's end, or, if needful, out of it. But there's one other question. Bertram, ought I to? She asked it more to see what answer Bertram would make to her than from any real doubt, for ever since that kiss last night she felt sure in her own mind, with a woman's certainty, Whatever Bertram told her was the thing she ought to do, but she wanted to know in what light he regarded it. Bertram gazed at her hard. "'Why, Frida,' he said, "'it's right, of course, to go. The thing that's wrong is to stop with that man one minute longer than is absolutely necessary. You don't love him. You never loved him, or, if you ever did, you've long since ceased to do so. Well, then, it's a dishonour to yourself to spend one more day with him. How can you submit to the hateful endearments of a man you don't love or care for? How wrong to yourself— how infinitely more wrong to your still unborn and unbegotten children. Would you consent to become the mother of sons and daughters by a man whose whole character is utterly repugnant to you? Nature has given us this divine instinct of love within to tell us with what persons we should spontaneously unite. Will you fly in her face and unite with a man whom you feel and know to be wholly unworthy of you? With us, such conduct would be considered disgraceful. We think every man and woman should be free to do as they will with their own persons, for that is the very basis and foundation of personal liberty. But if any man or woman were openly to confess they yielded their persons to another for any other reason than because the strongest sympathy and love compelled them, we should silently despise them. If you don't love Monteith, it's your duty to him, and still more your duty to yourself and your unborn children, at once to leave him. If you do love me, it's your duty to me, and still more your duty to yourself and our unborn children, at once to cleave to me. 
don't let any sophisms of taboo-mongers come in to obscure that plain, natural duty. Do right first. Let all else go. For one of yourselves, a poet of your own, has said truly, Because right is right, to follow right were wisdom in the scorn of consequence. Frida looked up at him with admiration in her big black eyes. She had found the truth, and the truth had made her free. "'Oh, Bertram!' she cried with a tremor. "'It's good to be like you. I felt from the very first how infinitely you differed from the men about me. You seemed so much greater and higher and nobler. How grateful I ought to be to Robert Monteith for having spoken to me yesterday and forbidden me to see you, for if he hadn't, you might never have kissed me last night, and then I might never have seen things as I see them at present. There was another long pause, for the best things we each say to the other are said in the pauses. Then Frida relapsed once more into speech. "'But what about the children?' she asked, rather timidly. Bertram looked puzzled. "'Why, what about the children?' he repeated in a curious way. "'What difference on earth could that make to the children?' "'Can I bring them with me, I mean?' Frida asked, a little tremulous for the reply. "'I couldn't bear to leave them. Even for you, dear Bertram, I could never desert them.' Bertram gazed at her dismayed. "'Leave them?' he cried. "'Why, Frida, of course you could never leave them. Do you mean to say anybody would be so utterly unnatural even in England, as to separate a mother from her own children. "'I don't think Robert would let me keep them,' Frida faltered with tears in her eyes. "'And if he didn't, the law, of course, would take his side against me.' "'Of course,' Bertram answered with grim sarcasm in his face. "'Of course, I might have guessed it. "'If there is an injustice or a barbarity possible, "'I might have been sure the law of England would make haste to perpetrate it. "'But you needn't fear, Frida. "'Long before the law of England could be put in motion, "'I'll have completed my arrangements for taking you, and them too, with me. There are advantages sometimes, even in the barbaric delay, of what your lawyers are facetiously pleased to call justice. "'Then I may bring them with me?' Frida cried, flushing red. Bertram nodded assent. "'Yes,' he said, with grave gentleness. "'You may bring them with you.' and as soon as you like, too. Remember, dearest, every night you pass under that creature's roof, you commit the vilest crime a woman can commit against her own purity. End of chapter 10